Okay, and the next speaker is uh, Tuan Le, uh, which will uh, who will give us a talk on supervised learning for molecular conformations. Thank you. Okay, um, thanks for the introduction. Uh, hello, everybody. So I'm Tuan, and uh, I will um, continue talking about the follow up on the theoretical paper we or Robin has described earlier, and essentially um, I will talk about um, unsupervised learning uh, on molecular conformations. So. Um, I think maybe interesting or more interesting than the, the toy data sets we have shown previously. And um, to motivate the uh, generally why are we interested in data driven methods and um, we have already list, uh, uh, heard very excellent talks here and during this workshop is that uh, essentially we want to um, understand the, um, the structure property relation of atomic systems. And what we usually assume is, or in the machine learning uh, perspective, um, this can be described as supervised learning, where um, we want to basically predict a certain molecular properties given some structure. And if we are assuming that we have, let's say our mappings, which uh, we want to implement are differentiable or there are any kind of neural networks, we usually assume that the descriptor is learned within the model. And this uh, learning paradigm assumes that we have already have the label for the molecule of interest, um, which we can obtain uh, through experiments or even through uh, computational methods, but still they might be uh, expensive with respect to money and time. So another way of learning a meaningful representation is to look into unsupervised learning. And, um, Essentially, since we are dealing with uh, molecular systems, I just want to reiterate that um, we basically can represent a molecular system or atomic system as a point cloud, a G, which consists basically of a tuple. So we can say, all right, we can store our point cloud into certain um, vertices, right? So we have N atoms in our molecular system. And additionally, um, which was also represented, presented before by Ilias and uh, his co-workers in botnet. Basically, we have some attributes. So we have attributes, which are basically some atom features, but we also have geometric quantities, such as um, positions, so spatial coordinates. And now in unsupervised learning, we basically, we want to um, train uh, a mapping or some kind of uh, neural network architecture, which can reconstruct uh, itself, right? And the idea is that, um, we basically want to obtain a descriptor which describes the entire physical system in one embedding. So therefore we are not, uh, we, we don't have, we are not operating on a node level, but we get really one embedding for the entire physical system. And this embedding is assumed to lie on a lower dimensional manifold, uh, which should describe the, in the, the physical system. And then it should be also informative enough such that we can utilize another network, which is the decoder network to reconstruct the structure. So this is basically the framework uh, we are interested in. And um, since I've talked already about representation, there were also several talks already at the workshop, I will be very brief here. Um, as said, we are working on point clouds and they can be essentially regarded as a set, right? So we have, uh, assuming here we have an ordered set uh, with certain attributes. So this could be atomic charges and atom types or, and other um, features for the atoms. And additionally, we have geometric quantities stored in spatial coordinates. And now, since I've already talked about the set and um, um, some uh, how we actually store point clouds in computers, and which is also very straightforward and convenient, is that we are just storing these uh, point clouds in matrices. And there, uh, we already assume there's some ordering. So pi, where basically you can assume pi is just like some node ordering how we store each atom in our matrix. So we can say, all right, this representation can also be stored as this matrix here V, which is basically the, the attributes. So we can say it's our atom types and we have N atoms, therefore we can store them in these matrices. And additionally, uh, we have um, Cartesian coordinates, which are um, geometric quantities stored in this uh, Cartesian matrix uh, P. And now um, since uh, physical systems are basically comprised with uh, coordinates, um, the atomic co coordinates are also sensitive to uh, SC3 transformations. So SC3 transformations are essentially um, just um, rotations and translations and three dimensions. So we just say, all right, this is the school. Um, we can uh, represent 
uh, one element of this group as this tuple here. Uh, um, and then we can say, all right, but this is actually mathematically, um, whenever we would uh, rotate and translate our uh, physical system, so basically one group element acting on the system, it can be um, described here uh, with this uh, matrix multiplication with the rotation matrix. So we basically just rotate the system and additionally we translate uh, each particle in the uh, point cloud. And as that, that um, sometimes we are also in, or like many features of interest, for example, as often said already in this workshop, uh, potential energy, these are invariant features to be very precise, SC3 invariant features. Um, and we can already say, all right, if we have these attributes or these uh, atom features, they are in fact SC3 invariant. So whenever a group of SC3 would act on them, uh, they don't change. So we can also assume, right, this is just the, the, uh, the element, uh, like the, uh, the trivial representation is acting on them, so they don't change. And um, in our work, we are leveraging uh, message pass neural networks as function approximators. So it's a very general framework. And um, the reason why we operate or why we utilize this kind of class is since we are working on sets, uh, we require um, permutation equivariance. And this is um, essentially obtained uh, in MPNNs uh, because we, um, we use functions uh, where uh, these are all shared among all nodes. So we basically, we don't really uh, implement functions for each node, uh, but rather we use one network which, which process all the nodes uh, simultaneously. Okay, so um, as I said uh, about the representation, I just want to talk a little bit about the method. Um, so we utilize an SC3 equivalent graph net. And um, since in our um, problem now here, we are just dealing with uh, uh, Cartesian coordinates. So we would just require um, basically, if you think about equivalent features, L equal one features, right? So we just have vector features. We don't rely, or we don't, we're not here interested in higher order features. Uh, we can store um, basically whenever we have a, a point cloud or we have a graph, right? Within the network, we assume there is some uh, hidden representation learned, right? So I say, all right, I can represent this hidden representation in XI. So it's basically this tuple. Uh, cons it consists of this um, SI feature and VI feature, which is um, the, some scalar feature or vector feature. And um, a very um, simple approach in message person networks and also known as uh, local inductive bias is, I mean, because you can also use graph neural networks for other types of graphs. You can also use them on just uh, molecular graphs. If you didn't have any structure, you can also use them on social networks, or you can even use them at, at um, um, like more uh, um, larger networks, which you might uh, work with in bioinformatics if you have um, drug uh, protein drug interaction networks or drug drug interaction networks. So, and in MHMNs, usually you will just exploit this uh, inductive bias of locality and you basically. Um, implement a message and update function, which was already also said earlier. And in the most general and easy way, you can implement them as a basically a function component where you have some kind of like self interaction, which is which consists of the single body term. And additionally, you can uh, implement a, a two body function, which is this F1 function, which consists uh, basically, uh, which wants to compute the interaction between neighboring nodes. And notice here that at this example, I've shown here this molecular graph where um, uh, we can consider A2 to be some kind of like target node, right? So A2 is highlighted in red and its neighboring set is uh, defined here, uh, which consists of three dynamic nodes. And then we can implement any function F0 and F1, um, but it also has to preserve certain symmetry constraints um, such as equivariance, which I will also talk a little bit. And now um, these equivalent interactions uh, are obtained uh, through a simple yet powerful um, compositions, which basically just using the tensor product or also often the outer product of relative positions. Um, in this case, we are using um, basically normed unit vectors. So we just compute relative positions, we normalize them. So they basically just uh, uh, describe points on a sphere. And then we are still operating on the Cartesian coordinates, right? So, but you could also use other methods just as therapeutic harmonics as um, described earlier. But in our case, we just wanted to have a simple model uh, and um, just try it out. 
And um, so we compute these agreement interactions by this um, uh, tensor product. So right, so we have here this relative position, and then we just uh, multiplied or compute a tensor product with this M12 feature. And M12 essentially um, is just an SC3 invariant embedding, and there are many ways how you could um, compute them. And for example, as described uh, in Christoph Schütz's tutorial or lecture, you could use um, radial basis functions. And then um, the other term here is basically just a linear transformation of the neighboring node. But um, there are also other ways if you, uh, if you just think about, you could just comp uh, you com uh, uh, complete if just from a deep learning perspective, you could also just utilize other functions. You could implement some attention-like mechanism, uh, which already also includes some normalization, um, such as whenever you wanted to compute some, let's say a filter between two neighboring nodes, because this is, you can uh, interpret it as some kind of like edge filter. Um, you could utilize some attention-like mechanism where you already then get it for free that uh, the filter itself is basically arranged or is ranging between certain values. And then you can use uh, also a linear transformation for the neighboring node, where in the field of uh, attention mechanisms like the inner or like this component here would be the querying key transform, whereas here uh, on the outer part, you just have the value transformation as in um, attention mechanisms. Okay, and now um, since we talked about the, uh, basically the, why I just talked a little bit about the method, I want to reiterate what we are actually interested in. Uh, we are interested in implementing an out encoder like architecture, uh, which operates on point clouds and in particular on uh, conformers. And essentially um, auto encoders are usually trained uh, to reconstruct its input data. And now, uh, since our input data itself exhibits certain symmetries, such as permutation symmetry and Euclidean symmetry, um, in most cases, if you're reading literature about graph encoder, uh, graph auto encoders, what we are actually is interested in is we just want to obtain uh, one descriptive for the entire point cloud. So we need to do some kind of like pooling operation where we uh, get uh, permutation invariance. So what we get here is we get an SN, so permutation, and in A3 invariant embedding Z. And uh, if you're familiar with autoencoders or variation autoencoders, this is often also referred as latent code. So this is basically the descriptor for our physical system. And then the decoders then task to uh, reconstruct the input. And uh, to reiterate, the input is basically this point cloud, so it's a set. And um, the usual input for the decoder is just this latent descriptor Z. So it has to be, or it, it should, or the assumption is that it should really capture uh, the most salient information. And then the question is, um, well, because our input can, could lie in any permutation because we're operating on sets, the decoder doesn't know a priori in which, well, uh, in which, uh, uh, how the set should be reconstructed. And, um, so basically, we, you can think of it as some um, discrete node assignment problem. And additionally, since we also want to or we want to do the reconstruction on absolute Cartesian coordinates, we don't know uh, in which coordinate frame um, the, the input point cloud or the output point cloud lies. So the answer is, um, as described uh, in the previous um, talk by Robin, is um, we implement a group equivariant encoding network. So it predicts um, a group invariant embedding. So this is this descriptor of our physical system. But additionally, uh, we need to predict certain other quantities uh, to um, get the group actions. And next, uh, once we have these uh, three components, uh, we use a group equivariant decoder. Okay, I don't know if someone, someone can draw. Um, that's weird. Anyways, um, we have this group equivariant decoder, which uh, inputs, well, this, uh, this latent descriptor and additionally the group actions to the reconstruction. All right, so this is then the framework. So you can see uh, we have as input this point cloud uh, where we have these um, attributes, because it could be atom types. And additionally, we have this Cartesian coordinates. We push it to our um, group equivariant encoder. We get here this um, permutation and uh, SC3 invariant embedding. So this is basically this one embedding which should represent the entire system here. And then we also get these two other quantities in order um, to get the group actions. 
And we use V um, to construct the rotation matrix and we use M to uh, construct a permutation matrix. And then um, we, once we input these three quantities into our decoder network, we can uh, apply the group actions on the output because since the decoder is group equivariant, we can either um, uh, apply the group actions before or even after the network because if we have equivariance, this is preserved. And the benefit of this is that then this outer encoder can be trained in end to end. And um, the next slide, I just want to show you some um, examples. It's a bit, uh, it might be not too visible. I don't know if I can show it, but I essentially, okay, that's maybe too much. Okay, I'll go back. Um, minus, okay. Okay, well, um, so we have here as input, um, we have um, uh, here this molecule, right? And uh, we could, uh, and the green dots, uh, they showcase the, um, the spatial coordinates of the input point cloud in this uh, coordinate system. And the uh, blue um, crosses, they basically um, output or they show the uh, reconstructed um, coordinates before applying the rotation. So notice that because our molecule could lie in any orientation, it is the same up to a group transformation. So whenever we have this output, we can apply the group transformation, which is this rotation. And then we can see that whenever we have applied the group transformation on this uh, blue crosses, um, the green uh, point and the red cross are good aligned. And we can see that it's also um, uh, performing well for larger molecules, but this was just some preliminary results on the QM9 data set. But we can see that for um, larger systems, uh, the uh, reconstruction, um, accuracy deteriorates. And um, we believe that there is some more um, hyperparameter tuning required, but this was just an initial run we did uh, a while ago and we just saw it works. And now we are currently still working on a follow-up. And to conclude and summarize, uh, I just want to reiterate that um, in many cases, the input data uh, exhibit certain symmetries and depending on whatever machine learning you wanna do, let it be supervised learning or unsupervised learning, Respecting the symmetry in the model architecture is very crucial and you can get um, efficient um, architectures. And in our work, uh, we presented an end-to-end -end, uh, data-driven uh, trainable autoencoder where basically the recipe is to um, implement these group equivalent encoding and decoding networks, whereas the um, encoder um, outputs this group invariant embedding, Z. So this is the, um, the latent code. And, um, and uh, additionally, we, uh, we have this um, group equivalent embeddings in order to um, kind of get the group transformations and then align the input with the output. And then there are, of course, um, several questions we can tackle because why are we actually interested in uh, obtaining this kind of autoencoder-like architecture? We actually want to obtain a molecular descriptor which can be used for several downstream tasks such as supervised learning, clustering, or even generative modeling. And um, this is uh, what we are um, currently doing. And I hope uh, we can also share a preprint soon, but this is uh, just the follow-up application of the theoretical paper, uh, which uh, yeah, we have put on archive and Robin has presented. So with that, um, thank you for your attention and I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you very much for the nice presentation. Are there any questions? Okay, so I, I do have a curiosity. How sensitive are your, uh, let's say, latent representations to reflection, for example? Yeah, that's a good point. So um, we, always, we always just assume that we have um, proper rotations. So uh, if you also have like reflections or even inversions, then you actually have improper rotations. And um, since we are, we, we haven't really looked into this, um, but in order to also capture these use cases, we would, um, we would also require to treat, uh, if we are just working on the vector feature, so L equal one, we would need to include the parity constraints. So we don't, we, sometimes we, we need to define then, all right, are, are we actually having like really vectors or are we having uh, pseudo vectors? So then um, there, there might be other, model architectures we should, which uh, we could use, but we haven't investigated it yet. But in general, it's a, a follow-up we want to do. We also want to 
kind of analyze the latent space being learned? Can we use it for other downstream tasks? Because this is essentially the idea why we are actually interested in this. Yeah. Thank you very much. Any question popped up in the meantime? Yes, one there. Thanks. Thank you very much for the talk. Um, so my question is, um, how do you evaluate the quality of your embeddings, the quality of the descriptors you obtain after you encode the, uh, your molecules? Yeah, so that, that's a good question. This is as, uh, also a bit referred to before. So right now, this, this network itself uh, is just trained on reconstructing its input. So we kind of assume, all right, this embedding has to be informative. So therefore, um, we need to, next, we need to really utilize this embedding, try, try out um, training it, for example, on other supervised learning tasks or uh, to see maybe if it's beneficial. But as said, like there currently this latent space, it's not really restricted. And I have just formulated like this framework more from a deep learning perspective, right? But you could also go it from a more probabilistic point of view where you assume you have some kind of like generative modeling process through latent variable models. And then we could actually also um, do more generative modeling, sampling, maybe confirmations, um, doing some linear interpolation in the, in the latent space and see what, uh, what a decoder outputs. So this is all um, follow up what, what, we want, what, what we want to do. So right now it was just trained on um, reconstructing an input. And of course you can always include certain other auxiliary tasks into the network if you're reading literature in semi-supervised learning, self-supervised learning, but you also want to enforce the embedding to be somehow informative uh, just uh, with respect to uh, some other tasks and not just on reconstructing the input. But this is uh, what we haven't done yet. And but we are planning to do it also in the follow-up work. Okay, maybe a follow-up question. Uh, um, so do you have any theoretical guarantee that somehow your embedding is unique? So you don't have uh, overlapping in the representation of two different structures in the Latin space? Yeah, that's a good question. So, um, so if there was an overlapping, the decoder would also output the same um, the, the same um, molecule. So we haven't looked into this, but um, right now this, uh, this space itself, it's, it's not really regularized. It, it, we, we don't know if there are, for example, uh, holes uh, in the latent space. So we don't even have this, uh, we don't have, or we don't know if, if it's really a continuous space. So we need to analyze it further. But to, coming back to your point, since right now everything is deterministic, um, it would mean that whenever uh, one um, molecular structure would, if it would map to the same embedding, then um, the decoder would also um, uh, map it to the, or it would map it to any other structure. But since we are monitoring the reconstruction loss and we can see that um, the reconstruction loss is fine, it is, it might be the case, or it's very likely that actually the uh, mo different molecular structures are also placed uh, separately in the latent space. But still, we don't know um, uh, exactly how this latent space is currently structured. Thank you very much. In the interest of time, I suggest to keep the discussions for the poster session. Um, one applause again to the speaker. Thank you very much.